Bonjour à tous. What with school being over and summer ahead, now seemed like the perfect time to share what I've been up to lately. The day after Easter, rehearsals began for Lajos Janáček's 1923 opera The Cunning Little Vixen, or Priodi Iski Bistrushki, or something like that. Now, not having practiced the music, I was dismayed to find myself concertmaster for the first few rehearsals, while my stand partner recovered from tendonitis. After two weeks of rehearsals with the singers, we were finally able to support Janáček's spunky little fox as she gambled about the stage four nights in a row, drawing peals of laughter from third graders and retirees alike. It may be a long way to Tipperary, but Westport, Connecticut and the Fairfield County Hunt Club are only a short ride away from the city on Metro North. During the First World War, local fox hunters formed a home guard unit, naming it after 17th century counterparts commanded by Colonel Nathan Gold. Long since decommissioned from actual service, Gold's Dragoons now exist as a military-themed club for eccentrics who enjoy bagpipes and tartan troops. Don't tell Shiloh. Dinner was followed by dessert, along with excellent remarks from Jeffrey Peck, a 50-year veteran of the CIA, who shared unique insights into Putin's strategy in Ukraine. Pipers wished us all good nicht and joy, and I arrived back in the city early Saturday morning. The following Monday saw the last of my finals as I handed in my orchestration of music by Franz Liszt, and on Wednesday I played Bach, Beethoven, and Prokofiev for my sophomore continuation jury. I hope I passed. It was with great anticipation that I boarded the bus to Basilea, an intervarsity Christian conference hosted by Young Life at Lake Saranac, upstate New York. Since I'd volunteered for work crew, I was almost immediately set upon a humongous pile of dishes as I exited Helga Agnes Hobart, our rickety dishwasher. I so enjoyed serving with Christians from all over the world. My new existence in the pits was punctuated by nightly devotionals and even my first time kayaking. But my favorite part were my conversations with longtime groundskeeper Paul Pillis, who gave me an historic tour of the property, constructed as a summer retreat in 1903 by influential New York financier and philanthropist Adolf Lewis. When the Adirondack Mountains became the playground for the wealthy. Now, we have one other stipulation here. Adolf Lewis, he was German, but he was also Jewish. And back at that time, as if that doesn't still exist today, there was tremendous anti-Semitism. The Jews were well accepted in business, they were well accepted on Wall Street, but they were not accepted in the social circles of New York City's prominent society. In 1904, you can do the math, he paid $205 million to have this built. So all the material, that was needed to build this, all the men to build it, all had to come across on that lake. On barges, bringing material and manpower, but also, very importantly, back then, when the lake is frozen solid, teams of horses could bring uh, everything from fuel in the form of coal, material in the form of lumber off the railroads across this lake on a sheet of ice by horses. In the walk up a very gentle pathway from the boathouse, guests would be escorted up this trail to Mr. Lewis's main building or main lodge. So this building here, as you can see from the sign, is called Main Lodge. So this would be Mr. Lewis's private residence. Now only part of it, the second floor, you're looking at his bedroom windows with that little bit of a balcony off the top, above it on the third floor of each one of these residential buildings, that would be the particular servants just for this building. As guests arrived, they would first enter Mr. Lewison's first floor of Main Lodge, and that would be considered his living room. A large open area with a grand staircase coming down. Now remember Mr. Lewison's private quarters were on the second floor. So guests would arrive, there would be hors d'oeuvres, there would be cocktails, 
any amenity that the guests might want. But they haven't even met Mr. Lewison yet. And at his own timing, he would walk down the staircase. Now remember, he was the one with the money inviting everybody. And that saying, and a hush came over the crowd. There would be absolute silence as Mr. Lewison arrived. Uh, he might want to make some declaration. He might want to recite some poetry for you. He might want to sing opera that he loved for you. Now, this is one of the most iconic, defining parts of an Adirondack Great Camp. You have a beautiful view, you're on water, and all the amenities are going to be given to you that we possibly can. However, the architects of the great camps want to give their city urban clients a feel of the wilderness. And part of that was each building of these 40 buildings here had a very singular purpose. Mr. Lewison's building, that was just the main lodge that was just for him, for his sleeping quarters and his very closest guests and his gathering room, uh, his living room to entertain guests. However, sleeping quarters like this building behind me that we call East Lodge, that was for other guests and primarily sort of under the care of one of his daughters. On the other side of the property was another daughter, West Lodge, and uh, she had her own guests there. But always when you had to go out from one building to another, God forbid you'd walk in the outside of cold grass or wetness. And so these covered walkways, this is the finest walkway on any of the great camps here with all these beautiful sliding glass windows. If Mr. Lewison wanted fresh air, these could all be opened up for air to come through. If there was a slight bit of inclemency to the weather, the caretakers would close them. So in perfect comfort and well-dressed people can walk comfortably from one building to another. Now we're in East Lodge. This is typical of the, uh, I wouldn't call it quite a living room, but a sitting room for the guests that would be staying in this building. There are probably no more than three or four bedrooms on the first floor, three or four on the second floor, and then the servants again for this building would be on the third floor. Uh, everywhere you go, every bedroom had a fireplace. This lodge right here, as you can see, has a beautifully adorned fireplace, uh, built-in bookcases on either side. Uh, the sconces here, these are copper, and that's a testimony to Mr. Lewison's wealth in the copper industry. So we've tried to keep as much of the original artifacts as well as the architecture uh, going on. But things like this floor right here, this is beautiful West Coast Douglas fir. Now that's nothing that grows in New York State, let alone the Northeast. The Douglas fir, that wood would come on railroads. Railroads were the key to bringing in exotic material uh, for the structure. The, the bulk of the structure is native Adirondack wood, but things like Douglas fir flooring uh, is something very special. If you'd step over here a moment. You'll see four little white pearl buttons on the wall over here. And that is, remember now, just random guests would be in this room. And if any guest had any need whatsoever, one of those four buttons would bring you a cup of tea, a gentleman could ask for a cigar, a lady could ask for a, a lap shawl, any need that the, that the uh, guest would have would be it. Now, who were the guests? The guests were the prominent people of America. 1926, uh, President Calvin Coolidge would pay a visit as he was spending his summer in the Adirondacks to Mr. Lewison. Uh, people of money, people of industry, people of government, they would be his guests. This was Mr. Lewison's uh, main and only dining room. Now you can see as you scan around, this is uh, probably could accommodate maybe as many as 30 people. So that would be the maximum number of guests. Again, there were covered walkways from all the other buildings that you could go from your sleeping room to Mr. Lewison's 
a living room to having dinner in this very room and never be out in the elements, but always with beautiful views of the lake and surrounding. This room we were able to keep virtually unchanged over all the years. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Lewison died on this property in 1938, middle of the Depression. And he didn't have a lot of cash that he was passing on to his family or his heirs. So his heirs decided the minute grandfather, father was die, dead, they sold this property. But remember who the clientele were. On this lake, the Seligman family was related to the Lewison family through marriage. So the Seligmans, who already had a property on this lake, they took ownership of this property in 1938. Now, they already had a fabulous camp on the lake, so they could, didn't want to use it for their own reasons. So they had the idea, let's make it a, uh, a resort, a resort hotel. Very limited in scope, again, maybe 30, 40 guests, and uh, they called it Seacon in the Pines. And uh, they, they weren't hotel people. They were Wall Street people. So when they opened this in 1938, and it was just for summer use, they hired the general manager of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. Remember, the city closed down in the summertime. Too hot, too humid. So he was the general manager of Seacon in the Pines in 1938. And they, for, uh, I, I can't say flourished, they functioned 1938, remember, was the depth of the Great Depression and the rumblings of World War II. So they owned it through World War II and previously the Great Depression until 1952. Now, if you look at this wall right here above the doors, right above these doors over here, it says Navarrete Pioneers 1952. So in 1938, after the Seligmans owned this and had it, back on that dock that we first started at, we have pictures of cocktail waitresses out there uh, bringing drinks to the, uh, to the guests as paying guests during the Seacon and the Pine days from 38 to 52. 1952, a lady from New Jersey, her name was Sarah Blum, she bought the place. And she had a vision that she wanted to open this as a summer camp for Jewish girls. Now, she didn't want to make it exclusively for Jewish girls, but that's the people she knew. She was a professional fundraiser for Jewish philanthropies. So the people of her, in her world were wealthy Jewish families who had wealthy Jewish girls and she wanted to give them an opportunity to come in this beautiful setting and enjoy the summer. And so on the wall right here, you'll see many names from Silverman to Schwartzberg to Cohen to Manischewitz. Those are all the last names of the Jewish girls that were here the very first year in 1952. Now above them are other names like Sheila and Jean and Peggy and Marcy, those were the counselors for each room of girls. So now we've gone from 30 or 40 guests at the property up to 120 campers with a staff of probably 15 or 20. So all of a sudden, rooms had to be modified to accommodate the greatest number. The walkway from Main Lodge to this building that walkway had to be expanded into a new dining room. And so uh, Sarah Blum, the names of the counselors at the top right there were not Jewish. She wanted to teach her girls that you could be anything you choose to become in America. That was a revolutionary thought back in even 1952. She said, one of you girls Someday, maybe a United States Senator. One of you girls might sit on the Supreme Court of the United States, and we just had Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg as that Jewish woman 
on the Supreme Court. So that's the kind of image and the encouragement she was trying to give her girls at, during their stay here at Saranac. But the counselors were anything but. She wanted to hire blonde, blue-eyed, uh, southern girls whom she thought could teach her Jewish city girls a little bit of southern charm. And they were good in sports, so they would, um, they would practice archery and uh, uh, hiking, mountain climbing, as well as all the water sports and the like. So that was the nature of this camp. It wasn't a religious camp. It was mostly Jewish. They have a rabbi come every Friday night for the Shabbat service. So that was open to the girls. But it wasn't for religious studies. It was for the personal encouragement of the girls. If you turn to our fireplace over here, one day I'm having lunch in this very room at the very same round table that Mr. Lewison enjoyed. And as I pick my head up from lunch, here's two uh, very diminutive, small, older ladies. And I was the guest services coordinator at the time, and I approached them. And it didn't take moments of conversation. Why are you here? Uh, can I show you around? They said, we have a pretty good idea what this property is all about. We were campers here in the 1950s. And they started telling me the most wonderful stories about their stay at what then they called Camp Navarat. And they, uh, they just went on and on. This one girl, now these were not just one week camps like Young Life operates now or like uh, Inner Varsity uh, runs right now. These girls, Sarah Blum would charter a railroad train and start down in North Carolina and come up into Raleigh, go into Virginia, come in through Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York City, and pick up all her girls. And so in mass, she would get the entire camp of girls delivered here by train as close as Plattsburgh, New York, and then uh, bust them into uh, the property right here. So they stayed for all summer, seven weeks of the summer. And this one girl said, I came here my first time when I was in second grade. I stayed here till I graduated high school. That's 10 years. And then I stayed on longer to be a Mr. A Mrs. Blum's private secretary and help run the camp. So these girls had a long-standing, wonderful relationship. They were so pleased, however, that Young Life, a Christian organization, still maintains this property for young people the age that they were back then. With tears coming down my eyes, with tears coming down their eyes, they deemed this to be holy ground. Not holy Jewish ground, not holy uh, Christian ground, holy ground, as you wish to uh, understand that concept. So they were just pleased that this was still up and running. Uh, we've had many other visitors over the years. One was Mr. John Loeb, the great grandson of Mr. Lewison. I had the privilege of showing him around the property. And he remembers being an eight-year-old boy the day Mr. Lewison, his great-grandfather, died. His family had a camp right across the lake over here, uh, Mr. John Loeb. And he looked around the property and, you know, many changes. He didn't remember everything. But he didn't even remember this dining room. Because when he was here as a Jewish boy, when he was eight years old, he admitted to me, I've never been in this room. I said, Mr. Loeb, how did you have your meals? And he pointed across the way to West Lodge. He said, in the lobby of that building, our nannies would bring us our meals. We were never to be seen with the adults, especially at mealtime. He said, even in my own home, growing up in Connecticut, I never ate a meal in a room with my own father until I was 13 years old. I know a little bit of Jewish tradition, and I said, ah, you're bar mitzvah. He said, Paul, you're right. Until I had my bar mitzvah and I was uh, initiated into the world of manhood, 
then and only then was I welcomed into a dinner of adults. So this is some of the rich history over the years. Uh, Sarah Blum was able to function from the day she bought this for about 17 years, from 1952 to 1969. Young Life, a Christian organization, was started in Texas uh, with our main camping properties in Colorado. We're seeking out a property for camping on the eastern side of the country. They looked at this and one altruistic gentleman that was in the search party handed us a stock portfolio mm -hmm. worth about $450,000. We cashed it in and Young Life was able to acquire this property for our own in 1969. So for the last 55 years, we've operated as a, a Christian organization, introducing kids to the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, giving them sort of an intense time together with others their same age and preaching to them, I put preaching in quotes, in a language they understood. And many, many a committed Christian made that choice on this property over the years. We're so grateful also that when we don't have high school kids here as part of Young Life, we have groups like we have right now. The activity in the kitchen behind us is all food being prepared for Inner Varsity Christian Fellowship, which has been using this property uh, once, uh, sometimes twice a year to bring their college age ministry from uh, universities all over the Northeast and uh, to spend a special week right here. So that's its function today. It was so hard to say goodbye to such good company in the beautiful Anirondacks. But there's much to do here in the city. Stay tuned to hear about what I learned from Shakespeare and more about Adolph Lewis. Until then, please like and subscribe. See you later.